Hello, my name is Breck Parkman, and I'd like to present my paper, Challenges, Strategies, and Rewards of Managing Publicly Owned Cultural Resources in the 21st Century. The ever-changing political landscape of the 21st century necessitates a new approach to the successful management of heritage resources, especially here in the United States, where a new administration has admittedly set its sights on destabilizing the legal framework that protects our most precious places. The challenges facing resource managers are many, and the available strategies for preventing loss are seemingly limited. But the rewards are certain to make our efforts worthwhile. I would like to offer a perspective from California, where until recently I was a senior state archaeologist with the California Department of Parks and Recreation. The California State Park System is comprised of over 280 park units and represents both the largest and the oldest state park system in the U.S. Park units are classified as state parks, state historic parks, state recreation areas, state beaches, or natural reserves. Park units range from the tiny 0.11 acre Watts Towers of Simon Rodia State Historic Park in downtown Los Angeles to the mass of 600,000 acre Anza Borrego Desert State Park just east of San Diego. Although I've worked throughout much of the world, I spent most of my career documenting, interpreting, and protecting heritage sites located in the greater San Francisco Bay Area. The approximately 50 parks that are in this area are without a doubt some of the most spectacular landscapes in North America. State parks in my area include the Beauty Ranch, the early 20th century cultural landscape associated with the great American writer Jack London, Fort Ross, an early 19th century Russian American company outpost, fragile painted caves considered sacred by local indigenous peoples, ethnographic California Indian villages, Spanish missions, a place called Olumpali, where once lived the Grateful Dead in a famous 1960s-era hippie commune known as the Chosen Family, a Vietnam War-era training ground, various kinds of 19th and 20th century military installations, historic and prehistoric rock quarries, numerous pioneer cemeteries and prehistoric burial grounds, the site of a former hermit's cabin once used by Kenneth Rex Roth, the poet Allen Ginsberg called the Father of the Beats the cabin of famed American photographer Dorothea Lane, and an historic Chinese fishing camp on San Francisco Bay, among many other things. The San Francisco Bay Area is a microcosm of the world, especially when it comes to the heritage sites that comprise our local history. People came here from all over the world and left their mark on the landscape. But as is the case elsewhere, local heritage sites face growing threats. California is a land of extremes, with elevations ranging from 14,505 feet above mean sea level at the peak of Mount Whitney in the Sierra Nevada to a point 282 feet below mean sea level in Death Valley, those being the highest and lowest points in the contiguous 48 states. At the time of the arrival of Spanish missionaries in the 18th century, it's estimated that there were about 300,000 California Indians residing in the state or about one-third of all Native Americans north of the Rio Grande. That number of 300,000 individuals seems artificially low to me. I suspect that the population of Native California was two to three times that. Today, California has a population of almost 40 million people. Additionally, more than 250 million people visit California every year. Many of California's intact heritage sites are located on public lands where development has been all but curtailed. California contains approximately 100 million acres, of which 242 million acres are owned by the federal and state governments. The largest landowner is the U.S. Forest Service with 20.5 million acres. The U.S. Bureau of Land Management is next with 14.5 million acres. Other landowners include the National Park Service with 4.5 million acres, the U.S. Military with 3.5 million acres, California State Parks with one and a half million acres, and various federally recognized Indian tribes with a total of 520,000 acres. The remaining acreage is owned by the State Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and various county and city park districts. 
About 16 million acres of California's public lands are used for grazing, and 26 million acres are used for growing crops. Yosemite National Park, located in California's Sierra Nevada range, became the first public park land in the U.S. when it was offered up for, for protection via the Yosemite Grant of 1864. Other national parks would soon follow, most importantly Yellowstone National Park, which was created in 1872. Of course, Yosemite was not recognized as a national park until 1890. Prior to that time, Yosemite was under the protection of the state of California and is, is thus recognized as the start of the California state park system, the first such park system in the world. Cultural resources, including aspects of the built environment, archaeological sites and cultural landscapes, testify to who we are, once were, and someday might be again. They are the landmarks that plot our presence on the land throughout the continual flow of human history. However, it's perhaps the land itself that most confounds the management of these cultural resources. Given that the land is perceived as a resource by those involved in the agencies of development and exploitation. Here in the US, there is an increasingly vocal conflict between the perceptions of public versus private land ownership. Some citizens, especially in certain areas of the American West, argue for the wise use of public lands. Their arguments support the ambitions of those in the development and exploitation industries. Most Americans, for now at least, seem content to leave public lands and public ownership and to limit their development and exploitation. The statements emanating from the current administration, however, suggest that the perception of public lands may be changing, at least in some circles. In 1863, a century after Thomas Jefferson penned the Declaration of Independence, President Abraham Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation, Freeing the Slaves, and in the following year signed the Yosemite Grant, deeding Yosemite Valley to the state of California as an inalienable public trust. Like the proclamation preceding it, the Yosemite Grant transformed the evolving American democracy. Whereas emancipation furthered the struggle for equality, it was also through the creation of parks that Americans were made happy, healthy, and free. The creation of our parks made all Americans landowners, regardless of their gender or ethnicity, Thus, the parks are keystones in the foundation of our democracy. Parks, like public schools, libraries, and highways, are a vital part of the national fabric, connecting the members of our society to one another. We are made free in part by the existence of the public lands, since the parks enhance our liberty and help to define who we are as Americans. The parks are remnants of the same American frontier that define the American character and our nation's formative years and they are sacred relics of the great American wilderness that settlers perceive to exist just beyond the frontier. The parks also constitute the cultural landmarks and monuments of our common history. That was Lincoln's purpose in preserving Yosemite in 1864. He wanted that this beautiful scenic wonder be made available to all Americans for all time to come. Like Lincoln, President Theodore Roosevelt worked to preserve precious American landscapes. After meeting with the famed naturalist John Muir at Yosemite in 1903, Roosevelt was inspired to create the National Park Service. During the Great Depression of the 1930s, President Franklin Roosevelt, no relation to Theodore, set millions of Americans to work improving the nation's infrastructure. In a Herculean effort, crews from the Civilian Conservation Corps and Work Progress Administration built countless roads, schools, playgrounds, libraries, courthouses all across the land. They built or improved more than 8,100 parks nationwide, including 29 of California state parks. Interestingly, 41 parks were added to the California state parks, park system during that time. These same crews also built 651,000 miles of highway, 124,000 bridges, 125,000 public buildings, 12,700 playgrounds, and 850 airports. By 1940, the WPA had constructed 70% of the nation's schools. More than 5 million men and women were employed in this laborious national effort. We should note that the U.S. government did not close parks during the Depression. Instead, resources were directed toward their improvement. Americans rolled up their sleeves, did shoulder to shoulder, and worked to improve our nation. We have our parks to enjoy today thanks to the efforts of this earlier 
generation. We can also thank them for our freedom since their labor during the Depression helped to prepare a nation for Allied victory in World War II. The unbridled population growth and global climate change currently facing our planet are undoubtedly the greatest threats to the preservation of otherwise protected landscapes. Slightly lesser threats arise from technological innovations and the increasing popularity of recreation as an activity. The population of the world has tripled during my lifetime. The effects of this massive increase are staggering. Natural resources are being depleted, migrations are unfolding, and the climate is changing. A crowded world makes it difficult to protect precious landscapes, such as public parks and heritage sites. In Sonoma County, where I live, the population has increased 500% in my lifetime. Not surprisingly, the infrastructure has not kept up with such growth. Thus, the local highways are more crowded, classrooms are bigger, and parks more overrun and increasingly loved to death. California's population is currently estimated to be almost 40 million, and the population of the San Francisco Bay Area is about 8 million. Population trends suggest that the local and state population will continue to increase at a constant rate. Obviously, such population growth will only exasperate threats to the protection of our most precious places. The San Francisco Bay Area is being affected by global climate change as well. Places along the coast and the bay shore that were once dry now flood during high tide and the erosion of coastal terraces and beaches is on the incline. As a result, important archeological sites are being lost at a quickened pace. There is insufficient funding to counter the loss. The national park staffs at Point Reyes National Seashore and the Golden Gate National Recreation Area have begun planning for the worse by inventorying at-risk sites. An activity volunteer archeologists from the Society for California Archeology span have recently pursued both in the Bay Area and elsewhere along the coast. Inventory and at-risk sites provides a snapshot of what might be eventually lost, but does little to affect that outcome. It is conceivable that future area efforts might sample at-risk sites, considered important for answering carefully prepared research questions, but such salvage is not guaranteed. To do that would take considerable organization, funding, manpower, and approval by various agencies. Natural and cultural factors threaten the protection of our most precious landscapes. To ensure their continued protection, it is necessary that we create realistic strategies for combating the growing threats. There are various avenues available for evaluating and preventing site loss. For example, efforts should be made to inventory at risk coastal sites prior to their inundation by sea level rise or loss to erosion. We have begun that effort in California, but there remains much to be done. And where possible, we need to consider using prescribed burning to control excess fuel loads that threaten the most important of our cultural heritage sites. There are over 60 million dead trees in California, casualties of tree boring beetles, the spread of which has been attributed to climate change. Given the current political climate of the US, it is essential that we work to ensure that the mandates currently in place to protect and preserve heritage resources remain intact. That would include legislation such as the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, and the California Environmental Quality Act of 1970, all of which recognize the importance of cultural resources. To facilitate this effort, we must involve the public in the excitement of what we do. By making our work more accessible and relevant to the public, we more likely ensure its survival. Citizen science style programs present a good option for engaging the public in preservation activity on site. This is where visitors take photos using their smartphones at fixed locations on trails and in parks, then upload their photos to central locations via the internet. An example might be eroding coastal terraces, where scientists wish to compile photos over time to monitor the rate of erosion. For those citizens interested in doing more, we have the very successful California Archaeological Site Stewardship Program managed by the Society for California Archaeology, a nonprofit organization. Members of the public can undergo a training program and upon completion, be assigned archaeological sites to regularly monitor for signs of impact. This program has proven helpful in the protection of especially significant or endangered sites. We must encourage professional archaeologists to visit schools and talk about what they do. School events such as Career Day 
are ideal venues for our participation. Children want to hear about archaeology from archaeologists, but rarely get the opportunity to do so. A few years ago, I received an email from a young girl in Ireland who wrote to me about how she might become an archaeologist. She said that she was only 11 years old, so no one would take her seriously. No one would talk to her. Fortunately, I connected this young girl with a friend of a friend who was a professional archaeologist working in Ireland. We each need to find our own ways to provide for the next generation of archaeologists. Advances in technology are exciting and hold great promise for the work we do, and yet there's a downside too. Younger generations have embraced a gaming viewing culture that is dependent upon their viewing screens and not one another. Older generations are quickly following their lead as well. We can use the same technology to educate stakeholders about the need for protection of heritage resources. We can also use this technology to get people out on the land to see the heritage sites firsthand. Here in California, I've recently worked with TV personality Doug McConnell in Canogal to create audio tours of selected park trails that provide brief interpretive accounts of local, natural, and cultural wonders. The public seems to appreciate it. Perhaps the most important thing we can do is reach out to younger stakeholders, especially the millennials, to ensure the continued relevancy of what we do. By keeping up to date with innovations and new technologies, we can connect younger members of our community with heritage protection by way of their preferred electronic devices, making heritage protection hip and exciting. Otherwise, it runs the risk of being increasingly perceived as dry, dusty, and outdated, a situation like one faced in many of our older museums. Americans faced a daunting fiscal crisis during the Great Depression, and yet their leaders chose to invest in parks and to protect heritage resources. Today, we are faced with a fiscal crisis of our own and once again must decide whether to invest in our parks or abandon them to the realities of neglect. This must not be a partisan decision, even during this time of hyper-partisan politics. I often remind people that it was a Republican, Abraham Lincoln, who helped give birth to the parks movement during the American Civil War, and a Democrat, Franklin Roosevelt, who sustained the parks through the Great Depression. The Civil War and the Great Depression were two of the most difficult times in U.S. history, and yet the commons endured, thanks to both Republicans and Democrats. The parks belong to all and continue to define our national identity. Our state and national parks are not revenue generating, generating amusement parks, nor should they be viewed that way. They are much more important than that. Like public schools, parks represent our investment in the future. Public lands are the commons we share together, a vital part of our common law public trust doctrine. As with public schools, libraries, and highways, the parks are a vital part of the national fabric, connecting various members of our society to one another. We are all free to enjoy our parks, and through our wise use of these open spaces, the parks help to define who we are as Americans. Indeed, the parks constitute a fundamental part of our liberty, and thus they help to denote our freedom. We are free in part due to the existence of our public lands, be they beaches, forests, or parks. These precious landscapes deserve to be protected for posterity because the commons belong to everyone, including those who have yet to be born. Our public lands are their birthright, just as they were ours. The children who were born these past few years represent the seventh generation of Abraham Lincoln. These are the children seven generations removed from Lincoln's signing of the Yosemite Grant in 1864. The philosophy of the seventh generation originated in the early 19th century within the constitution of the Iroquois Nation. It stresses the importance of making wise decisions that will benefit the next six, seven generations. The children of today are the beneficiaries of Lincoln's wisdom and his actions. Recently, I learned that I belong to the DNA haplogroup R1B1C10, also known as plus S28. Without burdening you with the many details of what this means, suffice it to say that I appear to be descended from a Danish ancestor who came from Southern Jutland and settled in eastern England between the 9th and 11th centuries AD. While I don't know his name, I do know that this ancestor was likely a Viking and may, not, may or may not have been called Mr. Parkman. That name may have come a generation or two later. The English practice of using surnames was introduced around the time of the Norman invasion of 1066 
and grew in popularity over the next couple of centuries. According to British genealogist, the surname Parkman suggests that my Viking ancestor, or perhaps one of his descendants, worked in the parks department of his time, perhaps as a warden protecting the king's hunting preserves and royal forest. The English parks of the Middle Ages were certainly not the parks we have today. They were reserved for nobility. Whereas I spent my 36 year career as a state archeologist helping the public access the parks, my parkman ancestor likely worked to keep the public out. All things considered, the concept of what a park is today is a revolutionary idea. Here in the US, the people own the parks and all of us, regardless of our station in life, have an equal right to enjoy them. If my ancestor was here today, he would likely prevent you from enjoying the local park. But the men and women who work for the parks today will welcome you. That is an important point and one with which I will close. Ultimately, it is in remembrance that the commons belong to all, that we all have the best chance of protecting our most precious places in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you.